1963, the United Nations gave Dutch New Guinea to Indonesia. The indigenous Papuans, who have lived there since time began, have been fighting for independence ever since. The Indonesian military, in an attempt to crush the Papuan struggle, have killed over 150,000 people. Since John Peterson Kuhn founded Old Batavia in 1619, the Dutch have slowly extended their dominion over the Indies. Until today, they rule over an area 62 times larger than the mother country. Their just and beneficial rule over Java and its 42 million souls, which makes it the most densely populated area in the world, and their successful supervision over the other islands in the archipelago, has proven them to be the greatest colonizers of all time. Well, what you've got there in Indonesia is in fact an empire itself. I mean, although uh, we imagined after the Second World War that by transferring power to local entities that were successors to the colonial regimes, we were in some way giving effect to the will of the, peop the local people, um, we perpetuated uh, local empires which uh, the European powers had established. In the case of Indonesia, of course, it's the empire of the Javanese because historically, if you go back before the Dutch occupation, um, these were all separate territories. They were ruled by their own people. There was no question that, for example, the West Papuans or the uh, Achenese were ruled from miles and miles away in Java. And this is the reason why you have problems there, that the military regime in Jakarta is trying to impose on the outlying territories of the archipelago, a rule which was historically never there before. The, the Indonesia is a fiction, it's a fabrication of the, the Javanese regime, which they were fortunate enough to inherit from the Dutch. In 1949, Holland transferred sovereignty of the Dutch East Indies to the Republic of Indonesia, except for West Papua. Uh, the United States uh, supported uh, Indonesian independence in the late 1940s. Uh, the reason was that Indo uh, Indonesia was a Dutch colony and the United States was anti-imperialist in the technical sense that it wanted to dismantle the traditional imperial system so that it could take them over for itself uh, and incorporate them into its own neo-colonial system. So in that sense, the United States was in fact anti-imperialist. It supported Indonesian independence expecting that Indonesia would accommodate itself to the designated function. That didn't quite work out. And during the 1950s, the United States and Indonesia became, uh, had rather hostile relations. Uh, at the same time, uh, the United States continued to provide arms to Indonesia. This, incidentally, is a classic pattern. Uh, when you want to overthrow a government, uh, uh, what the classic pattern is to maintain very hostile relations with it, at the same time to arm it. Uh, the purpose is to find elements within the military who will be capable of carrying out a military coup and overthrowing the uh, government that you're trying to get rid of. Now I have uh, taken the decision, decision that I, President, Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces of the Republic of Indonesia, appoint Major General Suharto, where is the man? This man. I, ha I appoint him as uh, Minister, Commander of the Army. In October 1965, uh, the United States was rewarded with a military coup by a pro-American general, General Suharto, uh, who immediately organized and carried out a large-scale slaughter. Uh, according to Indonesian sources, about 700,000 people were killed in four months, mostly landless peasants. Uh, this uh, wiped out the only mass-based popular uh, 
political organization in Indonesia, the Indonesian Communist Party. Uh, and in fact, it opened Indonesia to uh, complete robbery on the part of uh, Western uh, corporations. Indonesia was now available to fulfill its designated function. West Papuans consist of tribal groups who have lived for centuries as autonomous group. So we talk about Asmat people, we talk about Arfak people, we talk about Imotu people or Paniai people, and all these tribal groups all together is well known under the name West Papuans. But in fact, they are all different autonomous groups. And the tribal people have been forced to deliver cheap labor. They do not get any compensation. And if they protest it, they will be tortured for that. And at the end, they will be killed for the fact that they uh, ask for better salary or better treatment. But this, the company and the governments in general do not respect. The, the only thing they need is the wood, is the fish, or the gold, or the copper, and they are not interested in the rights of the local, local people. The Americans, under General MacArthur, eroberen on 23 April 1944 the first stuk Nederlands grondgebied. Hollandia, with a symbolic name, was weer free. Detachementen van het Koninklijk Nederlands-Indische leger waren met de Amerikaanse troepen geland en gingen onmiddellijk in actie. Most of the capital comes from the United States, from Japan and from South Africa. Those are the main investors in West Papua. Yeah, we consider any foreign company operating in West Papua as thieves, because we are the righteous owner of the country, of the land, and what's on it, and what's around it, and what's in it, under it. But still, the, these companies do not deal with the West Papuans. They deal with the Indonesian government, due to the framework that they had constructed this construction, this international conspiracy, in order to get their hands on the natural resources in West Papua. This we come to understand now. By supporting the Indonesian military system under Suharto, by having a big military support to this ar Indonesian army, which operates in East Timor and in West Papua, and in the other parts of Indonesia too, they control the whole area. And by stabilizing the country, and by having this in a tremendous transmigration program coming in, they naturalize the population in West Papua. And all these enterprises can only operate if the situation is, is safe. After Brazil, Indonesia has the largest remaining rain rainforest on the planet. And since there has been pretty widespread destruction of the tropical forest in Kalimantan and Sulawesi and Sumatra and the other islands, the uh, exploitation has moved to West Papua. The destruction of the West Papuan forest has, uh, has many aspects. First of all, of course, there is logging. There are the logging concessions. and According to the SCEPI, which is one of the 10 or 20 so uh, Indonesian environmental groups, more than 70% of the forest lands of West Papua have been granted to concession holders. I think the other thing is that it is not only the logging, it is also road building and dam building and other projects undertaken by the Indonesian government that are wrecking not only the forest but the lives of the people who live off the forest and to whom forest is home.
50% of the Indonesian government's income is derived from oil exports. One third of this oil comes from West Papua. Today, there are at least a dozen multinational oil companies operating in the territory. West Papua is now becoming sort of open sesame for the mining companies on a much grander scale. This is partly to help Indonesia to, what is it, repay its debts to the West because it's got a huge foreign debt of about 50 billion. And uh, to, what is it, reduce Indonesia's dependence on oil and natural gas and to try to expand the uh, to diversify Indonesian uh, exports. So West Papua is the target very much the target, one of the main targets for this new expansion of um, mineral exploitation. And Freeport uh, is playing a big role in that, uh, as well as Ingold, in, uh, the INCO uh, subsidiary, which is also in exploring now the possibility of uh, developing mineral mining activities in West Papua. In West Papua, the US-based mining giant, Freeport Sulphur Incorporated, operates the world's largest copper mine. Yeah, the exploitation of the largest copper mine in, in the world is not uh, benefiting the people who have been living there for, for centuries. Uh, again, it's like with all the other investments in West Papua. They do not like to have Papuan laborers in their workforce because according to them the Papuans do not have the discipline. So people from abroad are brought in to to have the job and sometimes the Papuans can do some uh, dirty work but most of them they just are pushed aside they have to to leave their lands and uh, try to survive in, in the surrounding. With growing international pressure for decolonization in the late 1950s Holland prepared West Papua for independence. President Sukarno insisted that the colony belong to Indonesia. He increased diplomatic and military pressure, culminating in a failed invasion attempt. the Dutch had shown for years a sort of a strong inclination to patronize Dutch uh, West Papuan independence. When it came to the crunch and when the US started exerting very strong pressure on, on Holland, uh, the, it, basically the issue of West Papuan independence and what the West Papuan people really wanted was lost. It was sort of just what is it swept under the carpet and what became more important was maintaining Dutch Indonesian relationships and of course maintaining US-Indonesian relationships and US-Dutch relationships and this whole triangular pattern that was more important than what, what the West Papuans uh, wanted. So all the negotiations that led eventually to the uh, New York Agreement um, completely ignored the West Papuan people. I mean they were just completely ignored. What threatened to become a brush fire war in New Guinea is smothered in the United Nations as Indonesia and the Netherlands sign a pact. Under the agreement, the Dutch will transfer to the Indonesians the administration of the territory they both claimed. Until full transfer next May, it will be administered by the United Nations. And in 1969, the Papua natives will vote on either independence or continued Indonesian rule. West Papuans refer to the United Nations sanctioned referendum of 1969 as the Act of No Choice. Out of a population of 800,000 people, only 1,025 Papuans were selected to vote. Voting took place behind barbed wire. The West Papuans um, saw the New York Agreement as a big step back for them, big, big um, setback for them. Uh, but then they thought, well, as lo if only we can make sure that the, this uh, act of free choice will really be an act of free choice, then okay, we will you know, try to campaign 
uh, to make that a success. But of course the Indonesians were in control. And any uh, move by anybody to, to campaign uh, to, or to demonstrate in favor of, of a no vote against Indonesia, were, they, these people were treated as subversives. Uh, there was no choice in the matter as far as the Indonesians were concerned. Uh, demonstrations were banned. Even under the UN period, it was not possible to demonstrate uh, by the West Papuans against, um, against the Indonesians and in favor of, uh, of independence. Even under the UN, it was not possible to do that. The people of West Papua were taken into Indonesia against any form of consultation. There was no pretense that uh, that was the will of the people, even though in 1960 the United Nations had passed a resolution uh, which provided for a general framework of decolonization that uh, insisted that there should be either a plebiscite or a vote of an assembly which was elected by a universal adult franchise to decide whether a particular territory wanted to go independent or to become integrated with some existing political entity. So that was not done in the case of West Papua. They were simply told you will become part of Indonesia and that's it. So this was a perversion of the process of decolonization and an unlawful departure from the rules that had been established by the United Nations themselves. And I believe that the United Nations should even at this very late date put that right. By way of transmigration, we will try to realize what has been pledged, to integrate all the ethnic groups into one nation. The different ethnic groups will in the long run disappear because of integration, and there will be one kind of man. Uh, in the uh, areas of uh, West Papua that were uh, occupied by, uh, in integrated into Indonesia, Canada, for example, is sponsoring uh, transmigration schemes called development, but in fact more properly described as a genocide, which will uh, essentially eliminate or uh, repress, probably destroy the native populations uh, as uh, Indonesians are moved in to occupy the area. The transmigration program in Indonesia is probably the largest uh, of its kind in the world today. Transmigration meaning, if you apply it in the Indonesian case, meaning you transport people from one island to the other island. In this particular case, transport people from the island of Java, that's heavily overpopulated, to the other islands. So by sending several million people into West Papua, you just uh, overwhelm the local population and just uh, outnumber them, meaning that at the end, West Papua will become a Japanese island. Of course, there's also a uh, an military objective in transmigration, the, what you usually call the cordon sanitaire. If you create all kinds of new villages the, populated by uh, Indonesian military or ex-Indonesian military around the border areas, around certain uh, areas that are heavily, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, influenced by the OPM guerrillas. Then at the end, they can also, uh, 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 what do you say, function as a uh, buffer against the increase of guerrilla activities. That's also an objective. So. Uh, all those, all those objectives of, of transmigration uh, at the end mean to obliterate 
the West Papuan population. There is a lot of violence coming on to the coming on to the West Papuan people. In order to protect these people, they found the Organisasi Papua Merdeka in April 1965. And it started in the bird's head under the uh, tribal people, Arfak tribal people, uh, leading, being led by um, Penehas Awom. And the Organisasi Papua Merdeka is been fighting the Indonesian military and the Indonesian system up till this very day. The military operations against the OPM has become quite a routine. So almost every one and a half, two years, there is a military operation. And that usually depends on the activity of the OPM itself, the guerrilla movement. So in the early days after 69, uh, the Indonesian military had to use kind of clean sweep operations, as they call it themselves, uh, kind of trying to uh, clean certain clean certain areas from guerrilla activities. So they had to use quite a number of forces to to drive uh, the guerrillas to different areas and so. But in the latter stages, let's say in the in the mid 70s until now. Uh, uh, the Indonesian military have used operations, military operations, more in a reactive way. There where the OPM is, uh, is launching all kinds of activities, there the Indonesian military will step up their operations. Saya adalah seorang komandan pasukan dari Markas Besar Nasional Papua Barat yang telah turut memimpin pergerakan perjuangan rakyat Papua Barat di bagian Provinsi Fakfak yang mana telah saya saksikan selama pertempuran rakyat terhadap pemerintah Indonesia yaitu Angkatan Bersenjata Republik Indonesia dalam pada itu sempat pada salah satu pertempuran di mana tentara Indonesia di bawah pimpinan Komandan Kapten Kosim dari Kesatuan Hasanuddin Kompi C 724 telah menangkap salah seorang masyarakat biasa yang namanya Naloklan Kibak pada tanggal 8 Oktober 1979 di pos Gila Jenkon yang mana pada tanggal tersebut beliau diikat kaki ke atas dan kepala ke bawah digantung selama dari jam 6 sore sampai kepada jam 6 pagi Lalu lehernya dipotong dan darahnya diisi pada sebuah ember. Kemudian pada waktu itu rakyat yang telah diajak untuk berdamai ataupun menyerah. Mereka datang dan berkumpul. Ternyata bukannya diajak untuk menyerah atau damai. Tetapi mereka disuguhi dengan minuman yaitu darah Bapak Nalolan Gibak. Itulah sedikit kisah yang telah kami saksikan pada saat pertempuran atau perang kemerdekaan rakyat Pakfak di Pos Yila. Sekian dan laporan kami selesai. Till now, the OPM still is fighting with bow and arrow, which is quite effective if you fight the guerrilla war. But we know for sure that we cannot win this war unless we are better well equipped. And because we are facing not only the Indonesian, uh, Indonesian government, but also the support from outside Indonesia to the military system.
don't uh, realize that the Indonesian need the church to do uh, the whole uh, difficult work in, in West Papua. Why, the first people who goes out to the remote area, they are priced. They go to the people, to the unknown people in, in the area, then they try to establish small villages, permanent villages there, and after they will build the uh, airstrips, and then the army is coming in with uh, military uh, staff people to pressure them down. So the Indonesians really need the church. That means uh, they need uh, the planes to bring up uh, all the, the military staff, to bring up the the goods they need, like uh, the food, the, the arms, and, and everything like that. Why? The military has no planes and has no pilots to go up to the mountains, to the small strip, and land there and bring uh, all the support up to the mountains. So they need really the church for this work. And if you, you work more than 50% than for the military, you, you can't uh, call them uh, mission work. In West Papua, over 200 indigenous languages are spoken. Indonesian is the only language allowed in the schools. Arnold Ab was an anthropologist and musician who worked to keep West Papuan culture alive. He was assassinated by Indonesian security forces in 1984. Ya, dalam hal ini mungkin sulit untuk saya jawab, tapi saya dapat katakan. I am the wife of a freedom fighter. The investigations into my husband's death have not been completed yet. No one has been brought to trial. Was he fighting for the OPM? I do not know for sure. But the case has not been brought before the Indonesian courts. If he's broken Indonesian laws, he was never sentenced. His death? He was shot, tortured, and killed. As a Papuan woman, the result of my husband's death, I am willing to sacrifice for the struggle. I lost my job, my livelihood, lost my earnings, the children were forced to quit school. Um, it's a bullshit uh, because human rights they are recognized or they are not recognized. Uh, they are violated or they are not violated. The violation of human rights in Indonesia is daily. Um, there is no change whatsoever uh, since uh, 65. Um, the right to speak doesn't exist. The right um, to live doesn't exist. Not a single. Uh, right uh, mentioned in the Declaration of Human Rights is respected. It has been always like that and it continues like that. Papua, As a result of Indonesian military repression, over 10,000 West Papuans have been forced to take refuge across the Papua New Guinea border. Refugees include a number of soldiers and policemen who tell the story of a failed rebellion against the Indonesian government in West Irian. On that occasion, they say, at least two men were executed. I gave 
order to my soldiers, the oldest soldiers, must uh, fighting for Papua Fre uh, freedom. But we don't like uh, in Indonesia. We like freedom. Merdeka! 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 The uh, OPM is fighting for the fully independence. And by saying fully independence is uh, not being colonized, but by whatever uh, government, whether it's Indonesian or Dutch or, or, or Australian or whatsoever. So being fully independent, as an example, we always say if Papua New Guinea can be independent, then the West Papua can also be independent because we are alike. There's no difference between West Papua and Papua New Guinea. So, and all the Papuans are convinced that they will, be, they will be free, they will be independent one day, and that's why they are all ready to, to fight for it and to die for it. So if we um, fell a tree, then we first had to ask him, I need you for my kids, for my mother, or this, it means we know exactly we are, we, what are we doing with ecology. But now, if you see the uh, multinational operations in New Zealand, take for example uh, Freeport Company, it's damaging the whole ecology. Not only for a few tribes, but for the whole country. That's why we are pessimistic. And our, uh, the other side of the problem is uh, we too. I think we have a message for so-called developed people, developed nations. We, they are wonderful. We have a wonderful culture. Culture which is can cope with ecology. But we are now going to doubt whether what you learn us is the better way of life. I don't know.